did he go today? Loving God. You know, in these devotionals, the thing I like about them is that God always seems to have a point to them. He's always speaking to me about something he once said and he wants me to do for myself, but also something that I already have a handle on, at least as far as comprehending where his heart is at. And then him telling me that he wants me to share it with other people, the things that I've learned and how it applies to my life as well as to maybe the life that you're living. Because today we have one that's really not that easy to understand, or maybe it is. Because you see, there's this idea in America that we have certain inalienable rights. The right to do this, the right to do that, the right to bear arms, the right to not bear arms, the right to do whatever we want to do. As a matter of fact, we have the right to create God in our own image. And we do. Half the time, we get away with it, too. Or we think we do. You see, American Christianity is a lot different than some of the other rest of Christianity that's out there in the world. Because some places, people seem to know more than we do. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but I've gone to other countries and they talk about sending missionaries to America because it's such a wasteland. Not the sinners, but the Christians. Because they see sometimes Christianity as being kind of like the way a lot of American Christians treat Catholics. Dead religion. Interesting, isn't it? How we all have a different perspective on the way we look at things. Now, Today might challenge you in a way that you might not want to listen to, so I'm just giving you a heads up right ahead. There's some statements that I'm going to make that are just blunt, contrary to what you believe in, I'm sure. But some of us, like me, already believe in. Some of us already have a book called Utmost First Highest. Some of us know exactly what he's going to say. Because you see, there's this idea that, oh, God did not make us a doormat. He did not cause us to just lay down our life and let people walk all over him. Or did he? You see, there's an idea that God has been speaking to me about called the Song of the Martyrs. You know, and I remember um, Eric Nelson and Michelle Pilar singing this song called Singing the Song of Freedom. You know, and they were marching in the darkness, seeking out the light, laying down the light or something marching to the sound of the footbeats, distant in the light. And I heard them cry out, sing the song of freedom, marching through the darkness, shining in the night, laughing at the crack of doom, bathed in a distant light. And I heard the fiery, whatever. But the point is, they were martyrs. They were those who were willing to lay down their life and not take up the sword and die by it. They were willing to be crucified like Christ was so that we could live. You see, we celebrate soldiers that are willing to go out and die for their country, but we're not willing to celebrate those who are willing to lay down their life and die for the salvation of another soul, are we? You see, martyrs in today's world are usually missionaries that go out on a mission and sometimes they go to like the Akla Indians or the, the natives that um, I was trying to think of through the gates of splendor um, who it was that went from Oregon and he had a promising I guess career in sports but he changed and decided not to do sports and become a hero kind of like Tebow or someone else that you might pick or Landry or someone else but instead he said, I'm going to serve God, and he went to be a missionary. And he went down to an unschooled and an unreached people and was martyred. And this was in modern days. And his wife is still with us. I think she wrote some books about it. Through the Gates of Splendor is one of them. I'm trying to think of his name off the top of my head. I just can't grab it right now off, out of my mind. Uh, oh well. It'll come to me later. But the point is, is that there are things that we reverse in America that in other countries the verse is accurate. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that Jesus laid down his life 
that he could have taken it up. He could have bore a gun on the side of his belt, and he could have, you know, like shot the Romans. But you see, there was something different about how Jesus was able to present the gospel, share the gospel, live the gospel, and be, in fact, the good news for all of us. And that was, they that not only live by the sword, but those that live by the flesh will die in their flesh. But those that live by the Spirit, you can't touch the Spirit. You can't even kill it. What are you going to do to a Spirit? Shoot it? I'm sorry, but your warfare is not flesh and blood. But it's principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It is God coming down and intervening in the ways of man. That's what the cross was. The death of the flesh. Yes. So let the Spirit would live and be revived by the Holy Spirit. Renewed or resurrected unto eternity. So you see, if you think... Your two cents when it comes to laying down your life, you got to worry about, hey, you know what? I got to get a gun, you know, because I got to protect my family, you know, and I got to make sure that I got it so that I can shoot someone, you know, just in case they come in, you know, break into my house. What if they're going to assault my kids? What if they're going to assault my wife? What if they're going to, hey, take them, man, my kids, if they're my kids, just say, my wife's safe. I'm not worried about her dying. Hey, take her, man. She goes to go home first. <laughs> Honey, bye. I'll see you in heaven. Oh, I'm second. Okay, cool. Shoot me. Boom, we're in heaven. What are you worried about? What are you so fearful, O oh man, that you need to protect yourself with worldly guns and things? If God can't protect you and God can't intervene, how real is your God? I wonder. The determination to serve. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, Matthew 20, 28. Paul's idea of service is the same as our Lord's. I am among you as he that serveth. Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We have the idea that a man called to the ministry is called to be a different kind of being from the other men. According to Jesus Christ, he is called to be the doormat of other men. Their spiritual leader, but never their superior. I know how to be abased, says Paul. This is Paul's idea of service. I will spend myself to the last ebb for you. You may give me pause or give me blame, but it will make no difference. So long as there is a human being who does not know Jesus Christ, I am his debtor to serve him until he does. The mainspring of Paul's service is not love for man, but love for Jesus Christ. If we are devoted to the cause of humanity, we shall soon be crushed and brokenhearted. But we shall often meet with more ingratitude from men than we would from a dog. But if our motive is to love God, no ingratitude can hinder us from serving our fellow man. Paul's realization of how Jesus Christ had dealt with him is the secret of his determination to serve others. I was before a perjurer, a liar, a blasphemer, an injurious person, someone who caused others harm. No matter how men may treat me, they will never treat me with the, the spite and hatred with which I treated Jesus Christ. When we realize that Jesus Christ has served us to the end of our means, our selfishness and sin, nothing that we meet from others can exhaust our determination to serve men for His sake. So you see, when you start to look at the reality of what Jesus says, when you quit putting religion in front of it and interpret it so that you can make it easy for yourself, then you might find out what it is that Chambers is talking about when he says, Jesus wants you to be a doorman. Yes, he wants you to walk on him. If they could get saved and walk on me so that they might know that Jesus is Lord of all. If it so be that they would kill me, then let it be that I die with the witness on my lips that they should know that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and that we fear no death. For death, where is thy sting? Oh, Lord, where is the fear of being cast into the fire of those who would destroy the witness? 
and there you are in the midst with us, O Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and one likened unto the Son of Man. Have I been threatened with gun? Oh yeah, lots of times, no big deal. Have I been challenged in my face with people? Oh yeah, sometimes pastors even, or what, anyways. Blew me away, it was kind of like the most amazing thing. I had a pastor get in my face. I thought, now this is weird. So what did I do? I cried, I wept, I implored, I pleaded, I reasoned with this person. Oh God, use this, my emotion, so that I might reach this man and calm him and bring him to a place of realization of you. For surely he's in sin and he's failed that which you have called him to do. Do you really think loving your enemies is shooting them? Do you really think that you can love your enemies and kill them? If God so loved the world, and we are not of this world, if God so loved the world and we are not of this kingdom, do you really think that evangelism on the one hand has a gun, and on the other hand has a Bible? Do you really? Because the excuse that I hear a lot is that, oh, we're not doormats. No, 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 we have certain rights. We have to protect ourselves. We have to stand up for ourselves. We have to assert the rights and the privileges of bearing arms, uh, of course, and two, our privileges as Christians and protection. We must protect ourselves. We must protect ourselves. As a matter of fact, we must get a whole army of people together to protect ourselves and start a crusade. We'll go with the crusaders and conquer Jerusalem in the name of God. How many religious wars were there? Do you realize how stupid that is? When you look at church history, and in another segment, which isn't for the devotional like today is, in another segment that's going to be involving Armageddon generation, we're going to talk, maybe sing, we're going to discuss the Song of the Martyrs as well as the Song of the Redeemed and the Song of Moses and the Song of America. What is the Song of America right now? The American Dream. What really is it? Is it godly or is it selfish? Be careful. You may find that the American idea is pure selfishness and it's not about God first. I'm sorry. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're all created in sin. <laughs> Come on, let's get real. There was a certain utopianism that's been somehow mixed in with this idea that somehow our forefathers were all perfect, right on Christians, and that their theology was all correct, and that they were all mindful of doing the right thing for the sake of humanity. When in reality, some of them were pretty selfish bastards. I mean, if you look at history, you know that. Slavery, they were making money, they were doing all kinds of things in order to, what? We don't want to pay. We don't want to do this. We had some things going on, you know. There were some manipulations going on. Let's get real. Come on now. They wanted to start the new society. Or if we could call it this, America, part of them, of the people that were in the 12 colonies, they wanted to start a new age movement. Yeah, that's part of our American history. It wasn't just godly. But it was manly, <laughs> manifest destiny. Oh, and it wasn't about God telling us to go conquer the Indians, but it's our inalienable right to go slaughter anybody we want that's in our way. Read the manifest destiny. That's what it was. The manifesto for our taking over of the lands. Godly expansion, 101. So don't get caught up in the ways of man or the understanding of man. Sit down, one-on-one, -on -one, you, your Bible, or you know something that inspires you greatly to go back to the Bible and say, Jesus, what do you mean love your enemies? Isn't there a way around this? I mean, yeah, you know, come on now. You can't tell me Sermon on the Mount's real. You don't mean that, do you? I mean, you, that was a idea, right? They slap you on the right hand, the right cheek, you know, turn the left, and then, then pull out your gun and shoot them. Really? What did you say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they that do these things, for he would be likened unto a man that built his house upon a rock. And when the storms came, and when the enemies tried to break in, and when the 
violent man came and tried to wipe them out. The house stood, for it was built upon a rock. But if you don't do these sayings of mine, your house will be built like upon sand. And the storms came, and the man came, and this came, and that came, and you know, you had your guns, yeah. But you were in a house that was built on sand, and guess what? Whew! Washed away. Oh boy, what do we say? Don't do these things that I've said. Blessed are they that do these things, these sayings of mine. Funny how that never gets communicated when you start to read the Sermon on the Mount. It's only after you get done after you get done with the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you if you do these sayings of mine. And what are those sayings? Oh, we'll skip over that quick. You know, we don't want people loving their enemies. He might become a pacifist. And that's not the American way. After all, we need to have, you know, our guns. We got to have somebody in control. I mean, we wouldn't want to, you know, try to assume that God could intervene. <laughs> we know He won't, because you know we've tried that before, and God didn't intervene for Moses. I mean, well, Moses He did, but not Joshua. I mean, Joshua had to go out and fight the battles. Yeah, he marched around Jericho. Okay. Well, he had to finish him off after he knocked down the walls, and then he had to. You know, do the rest of the work. You know, kind of like Jesus had to do the rest of the work. You know, he, I mean, he drove out those, those, those angry doves. You know, and he drove out those angry goats. You know, and he drove out those angry turtle doves. You know, I mean, that was rough because he took, well, you know, he took a braid. You know, and he just whipped all those money changers. You know, he was beating on them. Really, a bruised reed I would not bend over, and a flaxen wood I would not snuff out. So, did he hit the? Money changers? Or did he drive out? Drive out. Think about that. Hmm. How do you drive animals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Snap. Really? Overturn tables. <gasps> yeah, that sounds like he beat somebody. That's one violent Jesus. He turned tables over. Hmm. Wow. Violent. <laughs> Ooh, I want him to protect me, you know, when I need somebody at my right hand. I got a Roman legion, you know, coming at me. Oh, yeah, baby. Ooh. So, you see, when people try to explain God, <laughs> they crash and burn. Because you know as well as I do, ain't no way that Christianity would have been what it is if anybody believed what people are saying nowadays. Oh yeah, it's, it's supposed to be you know kind of like a compromise. You know, Sometimes it's a violent thing, sometimes it's a peaceful thing. Sometimes you know that's what makes it different than any other religion. Really? That's why all those guys you know, in the early church you know, died and were martyrs, you know, and nowadays you know, we're supposed to be soldiers? Shoot them? Huh. Well, it seems good to me. Interesting, isn't it? When you change the image of what God said, or Jesus himself, into the image of corruptible man, how quickly it becomes likened unto things we see around us, things we're familiar with, our own version of Jesus. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe Chambers is right today. Maybe Chambers did say that Jesus was a torment. That he came not to be served, but to serve. That he was willing to obey rather than stand up for his rights. That he was willing to submit himself to the will of the Father, which made him die for the sake of the world that he might save the world. Would you die if someone broke into your house? See, here's the story that I always get whenever people hear this message of mine that I share, because it's obviously not God's message. Oh, no, 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 no. You making that up, you know, it can't be God saying that. That's got to be your idea, because you know what? 
But my pastor, he said that, you know, we you know, we gotta get a gun, you know. <laughs> and we gotta keep a shotgun, and we gotta keep an AR fifty seven or forty seven, we gotta have a three fifty seven main, and we gotta get the latest nine millimeter, you know, we gotta have a clock, you know, we gotta have all these things, you know, and get you know, little C C four, C seven, everything else right here behind the scenes too, you know, we gotta blow things up too. <laughs> mm. Got the fertilizer. So of course, it's my interpretation of it. But the reality is, is that Jesus died. And in dying, salvation came to the world. So, if someone broke into my home and they threatened my wife, if I died, I wonder, would God save that person? Maybe. Maybe God, hmm, maybe God would use the death of me to cause the breaking of He and in some way in the future would manifest itself by the love that God would bring to Him. And He would, sure, suffer the consequences. He'd probably go to jail or prison and get the death penalty. But on death row, Maybe that man might do like the guy did that was hanging with Jesus, you know. And I mean hanging on the cross. Might say, uh, I deserve to die, you know, Jesus. But you know what? Hey, I want to be with you, you know, in your kingdom when you get it. You know? Jesus says, hey, you're going to be with me in paradise. Maybe the death of me not resisting would be the salvation of someone who is insisting on exercising their violent tendencies when I choose to love them instead. I wonder, do you think the martyrs did that? Do you think Stephen did that? Do you think Paul did that? Do you think those that were singing as they went to the Colosseum did that? Do you think the Roman centurion who threw off his armor and ran out to be with those Christians that were on the ice that were condemned and he died and perished with them? rather than kill them. Do you think they were all like off their rockers when it came to Christianity? Yeah, that was for those days. That's not modern days. So the modern missionaries that do the same, they must be wrong, right? These sayings of mine, Jesus said, what are they? When you read your devotionals, that's God's opportunity to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. When you study your Bible, that's God's opportunity to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. When you go to church, you're getting a lot of people and a lot of impressions and a lot of feelings and a lot of songs and a lot of cooperation You know, in a lot of ways to do certain things. So that's not really one-on-one. -on -one. That's kind of corporate, isn't it? Kind of like the masses, you know, that were at the foot of the mountain. Some of them heard the voice of the Lord. Some of them heard thunder. Some of them heard lightning. Some of them heard God. But not all heard the same thing, did they? You see, the one-on-one -on -one is where you're going to be on Judgment Day. One-on-one -on -one with God. So you need to make sure of this, because there's a lot of people now that are coming out with some new, really fascinating things they say. You know... Maybe this is bigger than we think it is, like Francis Chan. Maybe this God is bigger than we know. And maybe this kind of crazy love that he's demonstrated to us, you know, is just like really crazy. You know, it's like insane. Are you crazy? You want me to do what? Because you see, for me, the crazy kind of love that would demonstrate itself like that, when God says to do it, it's the kind of love that I've lived all my life. And when I share on the Armageddon generation about the Song of the Martyrs, we'll talk about that. About all the violent confrontations I've been in. And how I did not exercise violence. 35 years now. And I've been in some real interesting predicaments. How are you going to get me out of this one, Lord? Man, I'm going to get my butt kicked. <laughs> Lord, just let me witness when I go. <laughs> wow! No, Lord, don't put me there. I don't want to be 
like that? I want to use a gun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So you, I know where I'm at. I already know and have made that decision in my life. I know that every day I want God to direct me so I don't get put into predicaments where I shouldn't be. Like obviously, you know, you don't go running into a bank that's being robbed and say, God sent me here in order to witness you. Well, now if God sent you, that's great. Go witness to the robbery that's in progress, you know, see where it gets you. <laughs> Unless the Lord sent you, I don't think God's going to stop the bullet. But if the Lord sent you and he doesn't want you to die, there is nothing that can happen to you. God does intervene. I mean, you know, that's where people seem to forget. It's as though God put the law of physics into nature and he can't supervene it or supersede it. He did with the disciples. They watched. He said, no, what are you worried about? You know, a storm? It's not going to swap the boat on here. What are you bugging me? You know, where's your faith? And it's not a question of having enough faith. It's just, do you believe God? Do you believe that God can intervene? So, in your devotions today, do you believe, as Oswald does, that Jesus wants you to serve others for the sake of the gospel? and to minister to them. Or are there some things you just won't do for God? Think about it.